Hello and welcome to this Union Solidarity International weekly update. My name is Walton Pantland and with me is Andrew Brady. Now, the most important story this week is probably the Marikana massacre in South Africa. Many of you will have seen in the news and followed the tragic story of the 34 mine workers who were shot dead by the police protesting outside the Marikana mine in Rustenburg in South Africa. Um, an absolutely tragic story and it's the, the worst example of police violence against civilians in South Africa since the Sharpeville massacre in 1960. And uh, I find it personally very tragic because it's something that comes in the wake of the anti-apartheid struggle and the attempts by unions and civil society in South Africa to create a different kind of country where we had uh, fairness and justice and uh, trade unions who were able to collectively bargain and win better conditions for their members without having to resort to the kind of desperate action that saw a group of rock drillers take wildcat strike action in order to raise their wages. These are rock drillers who are earning around 300 pounds a month doing very, very dangerous work for a company called Lonman. It's a um, British mining company that's operated in South Africa for, I think, the best part of 80 years in various guises. Um, very, very wealthy, making a lot of money, and yet these people are paid an absolute pittance and uh, felt the need to take this kind of wildcat industrial action. I think serious questions need to be asked about the priorities of the South African state, which appear to put the right of, of this corporation to make profit and to continue to get uh, platinum out of the ground above the rights of, of miners to earn a decent wage and indeed uh, the right to life that these, these miners... And just to echo what Walton said there, of course, our thoughts and indeed our hearts go to the families of the departed, uh, this tragic incident, and I know for Walton this is particularly personal coming from South Africa, but we've highlighted this on our media streams as you would only expect us to do so, on our snippet page and indeed a fantastic article from South African trade unionists that are appearing on our website. We would encourage you to check that out and to spend a little time delving into the, the conditions of these mm. of these workers and you know just from Union Solidarity International if any of our brothers and sisters are watching in South Africa they say you're very much in our in our thoughts and we've got a featured article on our website that we would encourage you to check out. I don't know, Walton, if you would just want to yeah, say Yeah, um, Sarah Rightcliffe, who is a prominent labour educator and activist from South Africa, has written a heartfelt and very powerful article about uh, what, what this Lonman disaster says about the depth of transformation that has happened in South Africa. I think very, very well worth reading. Um, also worth pointing out for the speculators out there that, of course, this massacre has resulted in a rise in the platinum prices on world markets, uh, which you know just goes to the heart of how uh, capital and human rights don't always go together so comfortably. Indeed. Yeah, on the economic data, unfortunately more bad news from Europe and the Eurozone in, in particular, of course, Britain is experiencing a double dip recession as the economists like to say but you know behind that masks the pain for millions of families up and down our country. In terms of the Eurozone of course we have seen France grow to a standstill, Italy contracting by 0.7% in the last quarter and Germany barely able to keep its head above the water because 40% of German exports of course goes to the Eurozone. and. Something that, of course, USI has been particularly focusing on is Greece and Greek society and the economic and social conditions that our brothers and sisters there are facing. We've seen public debt go up, which is no great surprise when you're having a 11.5 billion euros worth of latest cuts. Uh, of course, public debt is only going to increase because of the lack of investment and unemployment rising as a result of that. And in terms of the economic statistics, which just illustrates once more why austerity just isn't working, in the last quarter in Greece, a contraction of 6.2%, and that is 13% contraction of the Greek economy in the last two years. Now, once again, mass behind those economic stats is the pain and the suffering that Greek families and indeed individuals are suffering. And we just want to highlight once again, and we're going to do this continuously, let me assure you, 
that the current economic programme being rolled out across Europe just isn't working. Mm -hmm. To the contrary, it is causing pain, untold pain for families across Europe, and it must stop. But if this had anything to do with economics, Walton, as we know, this would have changed long ago, but this is a political programme mm -hmm. that's been rolled out. And we will continue to feature this in our weekly updates, the pain that is caused by this economic and political project that's been rolled out across Europe. So once again, the latest statistics show that austerity isn't working. And even those UK economists who endorsed George Gideon Osborne's economic programme of a cut in public sector accounts are now beginning to change their mind because the facts show us that this programme of economic cuts doesn't stimulate the economy. To the contrary, mm -hmm. it just reinforces the downward spiral. Mm -hmm. Now, it seems that in some countries, punk is not dead. Uh, in the West, punk is just a retro fashion statement harking back to a rebellious youth, but in countries with repressive systems, uh, it can still have the power to challenge authorities. And we see in countries like Indonesia, P uh, punks having their heads shaved and sent to re-education camps and of course the case of Pussy Riot which has highlighted uh, the Russian state's paranoia about being challenged but one of the things which appears to have been hidden underneath uh, all the noise around the Pussy Riot trial is the fact that gay pride parades have been banned in Moscow for the next 100 years An absolutely unbelievable decision by a Moscow court to ban gay pride shocking um, cannot even begin to compute how uh, politicians in Moscow think it's in any way not only acceptable to behave this way but to think that it's going to be they're going to be able to achieve anything like it because it puts them so far outside the pale of world opinion and uh, you know where the rest of the world is on, on that this level of bigotry is just we really thought we'd move, move beyond this and uh, I think very important to highlight the story and to, to also um, make people aware of what uh, gay, lesbian people in, in the former Soviet Union um, and Russia are, are suffering from, the kind of oppression that they're experiencing, where the state is able to crack down on them to this extent. So we also need to show solidarity for these people and, and help support the, the very, very brave activists who, despite this, are standing up and uh, asserting their right to be who they are. Um, back to a union story, we mentioned, uh, we, I think we've mentioned more than once, trouble in the car industry uh, in, in various countries. We've me mentioned a case in South Korea recently. Um, it's not just happening there. Uh, Peugeot in France is planning to lay off 8,000 workers and, uh, and close car factories because of a uh, falling demand obviously due to the recession and austerity and uh, financial contraction Andrew was speaking about earlier. And uh, not just Fiat, but the GM Opel division and Fiat in Italy are also planning to close down some of their underperforming factories and lay off workers. So once again, pain for more and more people. And, uh, you know, the corporate criminals always seem to get away with it, don't they, Andrew? Indeed they do. And I feel as if this is going to turn into the Max Kaiser report here because... Uh, <laughs> Something that we feel deserves more a attention, and of course it's been deliberately drowned out in the mainstream media, is corporate crime. Mm. Uh, we've spoken about the, the language that is used to discuss the average day person who's committed a crime in contrast with those in the upper echelons of the, the financial institutions of our world where they're called irregularities, for example. But once again, we would encourage people to look at our snippet stream. You can do that via our homepage. And why we're encouraging you to do that is because we're curating a lot of stories that we believe our brothers and sisters in the trade union and progressive movements should be checking out. Of course, there is a litany. There is a, list, a litany of corporate crime, starting with, as we know, HSBC, who has now set aside two billion worth of dollars in order to cover costs of fines that may be incurred upon them because of their money laundering, alleged money laundering activities. Of course, we have lately the, the standard charter, financial irregularities, or as we like to say, corporate crime, where they have paid a 220, a £220 million pound fine to the US regulators because of accusations about money laundering. And of course, there is other irregularities which 
include banks such as Deutsche Bank and JP Morgan amongst a whole list of banks for LIBOR irregularities but as we know are corporate crimes and we want to just highlight these stories and we will continue to do so why people in the upper echelons, the financial institutions are able to make money based on some of these activities and yet pay off a fine to escape mm -hmm. custodial sentences because they're able to buy off financial regulators with these penalties, with these fines. Uh, and we just want to say this is unacceptable. These are corporate crimes. And with a crime of the, the, such of the magnitude that is being discussed, running into the billions of pounds worth of pounds, that sent, uh, fines just aren't good enough. And the uh, authorities should be taking action to put these people where they deserve to be, behind bars. Now, according to a group of prominent Tory MPs, the reason for the financial crisis we find ourselves in is that you're all too lazy. Uh, you're bone <laughs> idle, you don't want to work, and you refuse to get out of bed. Dominic Raab and a bunch of other no-hopers have written a book called <laughs> Britannia Unchained, in which, they claimed that they, in which they claim that the reason for uh, the financial crisis and, and the difficulty in the British economy is that British workers just don't work hard enough, productivity is low, and uh, everyone's too lazy. Uh, it's not based on any kind of evidence at all. And for example, the workers who work the lowest hours in Europe are the Germans, who also happen to have the strongest economy in, in Europe. Um, it completely ignores things like uh, how technology should be making should be giving us more leisure time, not making us work harder, um, and is once again just another Tory attempt to uh, shift the blame for the financial crisis onto working people, get everyone to work harder. And uh, I mean, if we're talking about idlers in Britain, I, I hardly think it's the working people who are idling. I think it's some of the some of the parasites. In fact, you've been mentioning <laughs> you've been. <laughs> this is true. Uh, yeah, what's your take on the story, Andrew? Well, I think uh, we're in danger of uh, giving it oxygen, of course. Uh, when it doesn't deserve to be given so. Mm -hmm. However, what is interesting about this case is that it featured so prominently in the mainstream media that, you know, there was in fact a bit of uh, authoritative mm -hmm. theoretical thinking and empirical evidence to support the nonsense. And it just goes to show once again how our mainstream media is falling victim to this right-wing rabid nonsense that does, doesn't deserve the light of day. Mm. And we would encourage the mainstream media, and to be fair, a few of them, such as The Independent and Sunday, did have a retort to say this was actual fact based in nonsense and had no evidence to support the assertions, but where is the rest of the media? Mm -hmm. And we just want to highlight this issue as, an, as a case whereby our mainstream media should be you know, coming down on us in a ton of bricks mm -hmm. and treating it with the contempt it deserves by absolutely demolishing it as a as a comprehensive and coherent argument. Mm -hmm. And you know, I like to think that maybe we've done a little bit of that today in our weekly roundup. But come on, mainstream media, mm -hmm. be demolishing do this and do your job. Mm. Um, and to finish off on um, Andrew, USI, where are we? Yes, USI. Well, I'm delighted. It's one of my most frequent words in this weekly update, but we had our inaugural advisory board meeting in London last week, joined by a multitude of unions, academics, and also progressive movements, such as Warren One, who we were delighted to be able to sit round the table with us to give us advice and to listen to their expertise. And I was delighted to be able to report to the board of the substantial progress that we've made in three short months. Starting from a standstill position, of course, we've created a website and created various media streams, whether it's our YouTube channel, our iTunes, or our, our snippet, Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Plus, whatever the stream may be, USI tries to be there to be where you are in order to communicate a message of trade union solidarity. And in that last quarter, we have had tens of thousands of hits on our website and snippet stream. And we have been able to aggregate thousands of interested individuals around our world who are interested in what we've got to say. And what I was very keen to point out that, you know, that's only the, the genesis of what we hope to do. We hope, hopefully we'll complete the Old Testament and indeed the New Testament. 
and we've been delighted by the support that people like you have given us who are watching this clip or perhaps downloading it onto your iPlayer or your phone, your Blackberry, whatever it may be, to listen to what we think you should be checking out in the trade union world. So on behalf of USI, I just want to thank you for your support and advice and encouragement over these last couple of months and we hope to go forward together with you to build trade union solidarity. So thank you. Thank you and once again, thanks for listening.